Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this morning's CBI at 10 webinar, which asks the question, how can your business step up to help young people? We're joined by a brilliant panel of experts who can really help to share personal experiences, the detail of how the various available schemes will work, and the things that you can do as an organisation to get brilliant young talent in to start developing your talent pipeline and do all of the good stuff that we know creating jobs for young people does um, for your business and the wider economy and indeed society as a whole. Before we get stuck into that topic, the main topic of this morning, I wanted to start um, with Lord Curran Billamoria, who of course is the president of the CBI, um, who joins us hot footing it, I think, from Radio 4 and a number of other media interviews this morning. It's lovely to see you, Curran. Good morning. How are you? Good morning, uh, Liz. Very well, thank you. How is everyone? Great to have everybody on the panel today and to be with you. Thank you. Thank you. I wonder if you might, before we get stuck into the conversation about apprenticeships and kickstart and young talent and things, I wonder if you might just sort of start by setting the scene, a rundown of things, perhaps pandemic related, that businesses should be aware of and, and, and need to know about. Absolutely. So we, we're in a position now with, uh, in the midst of our roadmap, with the next big date that's to come is the 17th of May, when uh, pubs and restaurants, hotels can open up for indoor dining. Um, and that's going to be a huge thing for the hospitality sector that suffered so much. I mean, 4 million people employed by the hospitality and tourism sector suffered so much over the last year. I can say from my own business, Cobra Beer, where we supply over 7,000 restaurants, uh, how much our customers have, have suffered. So that's one. And the 21st of June is the next date when we're meant to fully reopen. But while that is happening and while our vaccination program is going so brilliantly, and you know, hats off to Nadeem Zahawi, our vaccinations minister, um, that we, you know, we've vaccinated well over 30 million people, coming up to 15 million second doses. Uh, we're well on our way. We've got great news uh, coming out day by day that the vaccines are not only helping you uh, not fall ill seriously and go to hospital, uh, or let alone sadly die, uh, but they're also helping prevent uh, infection. So it's for you, preventing you from infecting others, uh, which is terrific. I mean, this is what we'd hoped for that is now being proven day by day. So that's all great news. So um, fast forward, and we should be as a country relatively fully protected. Our sad deaths are going down now to well under 20. The infections are very low numbers. But, and this is the big but, two months ago, I'm originally from India. I thought India had beaten the virus. In, in India, two months ago, the sad deaths were less than 100 a day for a country of 1.4 billion people. I mean, we literally, many, many of us thought India has beaten this virus. And look at what is happening today. I mean, it's just tragic. It's awful. Um, I'm on the phone to my family every day, sometimes many times a day. And it is uh, not just a crisis. It is a huge, huge, desperate crisis. So we at the CBI have, have really, and this is where our organization is fantastic. We're the biggest business organization in the country, 190,000 members we speak for, you know, 7 million people. That's one third of the private sector workforce. But people don't appreciate we also have almost 200 of the leading trade associations as our members from the National Farmers Union to the Law Society. And the trade associations come to the fore. So since this weekend, I have been working with our team at CBI flat out to try and help the effort with the Indian High Commissioner in London, with the British High Commissioner in Delhi. And wow, I mean, if I just give you a few quick examples, British Oxygen are a member of ours. This is through the Association of Compressed Air Manufacturers. They are sending cylinders out uh, to India. We need oxygen cylinders are desperately needed. Then. We've got members of ours in Scotland who produce oxygen generating machines. Each one of these machines uh, can power a ward of up to 50 people. Then you've got oxygen concentrators that can, that's up to two people uh, that they can, so lots of those can be sent. Ventilators, we had the ventilator challenge last year, we've got ventilators we can send over. Um, and the big one, of course, are the drugs. And Remdesivir is the, is the one that is needed in an acute situation. Gilead, one of our members, headquartered in America, What's the problem? Only 120,000 of these vials are being manufactured in India through the seven giant pharmaceutical companies, and they can't produce enough. So Gilead's are sending 450,000 across. That's a drop in the ocean in the last two or three days. These companies are ramping up their production in India. It'll take them two, three weeks to do that. We're trying now to coordinate an international effort to get Remdesivir from all around the world, any spare capacity to India. And then looking ahead, there's going to be PPE required. Looking ahead, there's lateral flow devices. We've now got three lateral flow testing which we've been fighting for since last summer, I've been fighting for this, and the CBI is now free not only to businesses, but every one of us can get lateral flow devices at our home free to test ourselves. India doesn't have enough of those. We can now help them with those as well. So there's a lot that we're doing at the CBI. I'm really proud of our team. If any of you can help, 
please, please get in touch with us. Uh, we need that help. India needs the help at the moment. The situation is dire and it's not going to go away. This is going to be the case for a while. We can help. Um, thank you so much. I'm, I'm thrilled to hear the amazing work that's already been coming in, the support that's been happening with, with CBI members. Alice, I've just seen us posted in the chat um, uh, the part of the website you can go to to understand how you can engage and get involved if you feel like you've got capacity or resources or skills or something that can that can help channel um, the efforts into India. So thank you so much for that um, introduction. I'm, I'm going to have to do what, what my boss James Harding now calls a handbrake turn, which is we're going from talking about this to going to talking about over there because, as you say, in in, in the UK, the position is sort of we've tend we sort of allowed ourselves to feel a little bit more optimistic recently. At least I I, I certainly have. And the conversation we want to have this morning is about uh, is an optimistic conversation. We're talking about opportunities. We're talking about skills. We're talking about young talent. And you know, young people have been really walloped, particularly by the employment situation, in particular of the, of the pandemic. So I wonder if you might set the scene a little bit for us, um, Current, on on why we. We've selected this particular topic for today's webinar what what makes it so important yes of course uh, I, I think that there's no question about it young people have uh, suffered hugely during this crisis whether it's school children whether it's university students I mean I, I feel very strongly that university students at the moment are still not allowed to go back to university and have teaching until the 17th of May I mean I've spoken about this in Parliament I think that's wrong I think it's illogical I think it's unfair on the students unfair on the university and unfair on our economy um, and then when it comes to to business I mean uh, ONS figures last week showed that over half of people who dropped off the UK payroll in the last year were under 25 and so we want to see a scale of investment and economic vision that will ensure uh, that young people, a young person leaving education in the next few years can have a long and fulfilling uh, career. I mean, when, as Chancellor of the University of Birmingham, when I speak to our students at graduation, we talk about their future and their, their jobs. And, uh, you know, in the past, they had a very high employment rate. Uh, but now you know, we've got the situation where, although the furlough scheme was, has been hugely successful, saving millions of jobs and millions of businesses, both in uh, employed and self-employed, we know that youth unemployment uh, has been a particularly hard worry for us it's youth employment that's been hit over the past year so young people uh, those under the age of 19 have borne the brunt in the drop in apprenticeship starts since the pandemic young people have experienced um, over a year of as i've said disrupted in education um, and so there's it's vital that employers uh, play their part in preventing uh, the long-term scarring of young people's uh, employment prospects. We cannot go, when I was on the National Employment Panel years ago, we'd go field visits and you would come across areas in the UK where you have three generations of family who'd never worked. Uh, we cannot have a situation after the financial crisis, 2008-2009, uh, when unemployment nearly went up to 10%. Fortunately, thanks to the government's measures, we've now got unemployment at around 5%. It was 3.5% before the pandemic. So we've got to make sure we save those jobs and those businesses. And, and, and taking young talent through employment schemes is hugely impactful in the way that employers can help. And many businesses have already gone to huge lengths, um, engaging with schools and colleges, uh, work experience and training online. I mean, at Cobra Beer, we've had a fantastic internship scheme for many years. It's hugely popular, hugely valuable to the people who take part and to the business. Um, we haven't been able to do that, but people have still tried their very best. So many young people leaving education in 2021 have missed out on vital early work experience, other opportunities, internships that we have not been able to carry out. Many other companies have not been able to. Uh, you get employability skills, communication, teamwork, you build confidence. So schemes like the government's kickstart are phenomenal. Um, apprenticeships, traineeships, uh, these have employability skill development built into them. Uh, they make, they're very effective in the way that business can help young people whose education has been disrupted uh, by the pandemic. And so that's why um, I've written about this, I've spoken about this, and the CBI is calling out to the government, who, by the way, have listened to us throughout the pandemic in every area. I call it not a flip-flop or a U-turn government. It's a government that listens listens to organizations like CBI when we've asked for extensions in the further scheme, when we've asked and going back to last summer for social distancing not to be two meters, but one meter based on evidence, uh, for the VAT to be dropped from 20% to 5% for hospitality. All these measures, um, the 100% bounce back loans, the government guarantee was originally only 80%. We said we need 100% for the money to flow through. They listen. Now over 1.6 million companies have benefited from government guaranteed loans, uh, approaching almost 
80 billion pounds. So the government has listened, and I'm asking the government now to listen for a six month extension of the kickstart scheme, which is currently due to end uh, at the end of 2021. And the government's aim is to create 250,000 jobs through the kickstart scheme. At the moment, 180,000 placements have been approved, but here's the but. Only around 12,000 have started due to delays caused by the third lockdown and bureaucracy. So extending the kickstart would ensure that as many young people can benefit from the scheme as possible. We also need a clear pathway into skilled employment between the three schemes, which are clear to employers. So our goal should be to ensure that as many kickstarters as possible build confidence, develop their skills with the aim of securing a full-time future job or apprenticeship. And, and there's also uh, scaling up links between traineeships and apprenticeships. So stepping up for young people goes hand in hand with effect talent pipeline planning. Businesses need a highly skilled workforce that can meet the needs of our rapidly changing economy and it'll be impossible to meet this challenge if young people are disengaged from the labor market. And many businesses are successfully using youth employment schemes to identify talent from underrepresented groups, such as young people from socioeconomically disadvantaged or ethnic minority backgrounds. I'm very proud as the first ethnic minority president of the CBI in its 60 year history to have launched with the CBI, led by the CBI with help from some of our members, phenomenal help, Deloitte's have helped us a lot. Uh, it's been amazing. Uh, Brunswick to launch Change the Race Ratio, which is championing ethnic minority participation in business across the board. So uh, if you don't know about it, please look it up and please sign up to Change the ratio, Race Ratio. We've almost got almost 100 leading companies um, from Aviva to BP to HSP, leading companies in the country, uh, DRG, they've all signed up to it. Please sign up to it. So uh, I, I, a final plea uh, to those of you on this call, please get in touch with the CBI to share your experiences of these uh, youth employment schemes. Let us know uh, what you think is working, what you think is not working, what you think could be improved. So huge amount to be done. I'm looking forward to the discussion today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. A brilliant setup um, for all the reasons why this really matters and can be hugely beneficial to both the individual um, who benefits from it and the business and indeed the wider community as well. I'm going to come next, if I can, to Alyssa. Alyssa Dhaliwal, now you head up education and skills at the CBI. And I think what would be helpful if we take it as read that everybody on the call this morning is sort of phys physically, ideologically bought in and, and ready to go, sometimes it's not always obvious what you do next. What is there that's available? How does it all work? And if I'm sitting there as a business, large or small, what are, what are the things I need to be considering if I'm thinking, OK, new talent pipeline, what, what can I do to engage, particularly with Kickstart? Let's start there. Thanks, Liz. So I think for, for businesses on the call that are thinking about this, I'd say the first step is to really ask yourself, what do I want to achieve for my business through supporting a young person and, and why? And essentially, I think once you've answered those questions and you're really um, understanding of what the main motivation is, I think then you can go on to the how and find out what the right scheme is for your organisation. So I think we've found from speaking to businesses that there are typically kind of two main motivations. So the first one is that motivation of doing this because it's the right thing for CSR purposes and really helping young people to tackle long term unemployment. So if that's something that your business is really passionate about and thinking about, then I think the Kickstart scheme is the right option for you. So um, the Kickstart scheme offers a six month work placement in new jobs created by using grant funding from the government. And it's aimed at 16 to 24 year olds who are currently out of work, um, claim a universal credit and are at risk of long term unemployment. Now, for a business, you'll receive 100% of wages, which is subsidised at the national minimum wage or national living wage, depending on um, the age of the young person. And all of that young person's time will be spent in the business, um, helping to develop their um, work skills, training, and um, specifically transferable skills as well. So the aim of that scheme is really to help a young person get their first foot in the door, support them for six months. And the long-term aim is to then make sure that they are well prepared for potentially an apprenticeship um, or long-term kind of work with that organization or another organization. 
Um, and I think for, for members and businesses that are thinking about the Kickstart scheme, it's also a great opportunity um, for, for organisations to test a new additional job. So one of the key criteria for Kickstart is that it needs to be an additional role. So for some businesses who might be umming and ahhing about um, adding an additional job into the organisation, it's a great way to test that out before fully confirming. So that is, um, I think, the Kickstart scheme in, in a nutshell. But I'd say for other organisations that are more primarily motivated by hiring needs and actually having a specific business need that they need to address by developing um, a specific skill in their organisation, then Kickstart might not be the best option for them. Um, it might be that a traineeship or an apprenticeship is um, actually the better option in that case. So a traineeship is a skills development programme. It includes a work placement and it can last between six weeks or up to a year. Um, although most traineeships last um, for less than six months, um, your business needs to be able to offer at least 70 hours of safe, meaningful and high quality work experience. And I think the traineeship option is great if you have, again, a specific need that you're looking to kind of train and develop in that organisation. Um, and the trainee will gain kind of really key um, skills in English, math um, and digital um, work related qualifications, which is great for, for that young person. Um, and a traineeship can also lead to a kickstart. Um, placement or an apprenticeship. So again, there's progression throughout the schemes, which I know is something that businesses are very um, keen to see. Um, and then the final option, again, if you're, you're looking um, at being more focused on hiring needs or specific um, skills development in your organisation, I'd say um, an apprenticeship might be a good route um, for that instead. So apprenticeships, as many of you know, are jobs which combine practical on the skills, um, tra job training um, with on the job learning as well. Um, and can be available from entry level to, to master's um, degree equivalent. Um, and the employee then kind of gains the skills that are really relevant for that business and organization. But again, it's really important in um, an apprenticeship that those skills and knowledge kind of help develop um, that young person to transfer within the organization. So again, it's building that talent pipeline um, to, to be really strong. And government have um, currently um, announced an incentive payment of £3,000 for new apprentice, um, apprentices that are taken on between the 1st of April and the 30th of September. So again, that's a little bit of a, a push for um, employers that might need that extra support um, to take on an apprentice. So that payment can be used to support anything from, you know, um, uniforms through to um, any um, apprentices travel as well. So I think that's um, a really positive from government um, also. And again, really important is to note that progression point. Again, apprentices often um, stay with their business for a long time. So it's great um, kind of talent pipeline development, which we've already spoken about. So many different schemes, but I think the first thing that businesses should be thinking about is what do I really want to get from this? And how can I make sure that um, the scheme that I choose really fits with my business goals that I'm trying to achieve over the coming year. Thanks, Alyssa. I just want to double check a couple of the sort of granular details of this just to make sure I've got my head around it properly. So with Kickstart, is that designed specifically for kind of school leaver age? It's that entry level position and it's six months and the government effectively covers the wages of that person for that six month placement. Correct. Yeah, very much for those that are entering the workforce for the first time. So the 16 to 24 year old age group um, getting their first kind of feet in the ladder of the, the jobs market. And as it stands, the expiry of the kickstart scheme is set for when? So new placements can start up until the end of this year. Um, as Lord Billamoria mentioned, the CBI is calling for an extension to that scheme because we know that for many businesses, um, the lockdowns have meant that they haven't been able to start people on those placements. So um, although the government has said that it's going to end um, at the end of this year, so that's when placements will have to be started. We're calling for six months to that application process. Great. I'm going to come on and talk in a second to Jonathan, uh, who has experience of a long standing experience of apprenticeships and uh, is active in the Kickstart scheme as well. I'd love to hear a little bit about how it's working in practice. Before I do that, I just want to touch on on the apprenticeship scheme that you mentioned a £3,000 sort of incentive for each new apprentice. Is that a sort of, you know, in perpetuity government policy? Is that time boxed? What's the kind of ramifications of that one? Yeah, so employers will receive £3,000 um, for new apprentices of any age who join their organisation from the 1st of April 2021 to September 2021. And you can apply for these incentive payments um, from June the 1st um, of this year up until November um, 2021. 
Okay, great. So there's a window of opportunity there. That's brilliant context. Thanks so much, Alyssa. I'm going to come now, if I can, to Jonathan, Jonathan Foote, um, who's Head of Apprenticeships and Early Careers at Compass Group. I've done a little bit of work with Compass Group in the past, and I know how much the talent pipeline, young talent, social mobility actually is often the framing. It, it's a huge, huge part of the culture of the organisation, not just what makes Compass unique and different but also it makes you very very successful so i'm i'm thrilled that you're here this morning and um, to talk to us jonathan why did compass choose to engage with kickstart in particular just tell us a little bit about what your you know how it's going how many you've got all of that stuff yeah thanks liz so we at compass group absolutely committed to um kickstart around our social mobility pledge um, as you say, it's, it's the culture of our business. Um, we're very much around supporting the levelling up agenda as part of that social mobility, and we absolutely saw Kickstart um, enabling that to happen to support young people 16 to 24 um, into us. We're calling them skills development opportunity, um, and then we see it very much as a future talent pipeline, giving us the opportunity in the hospitality industry as the business um, starts to slowly reopen that we're actually developing training coaching and mentoring our future talent pipeline coming through the Kickstart programme. Um, we, we were one of the first large employers to um, put our application into DWP um, and it was seamless process um, for the first um, part of that um, and then we put in for 50 opportunities initially and we've just put in for another additional 150 uh, as we slowly open up and we can support these individuals in those additional placements throughout our business sectors. Um, it's also, as, as already been mentioned, in terms of the Build Back Better government um, paper, that we also plan for growth and for jobs. We absolutely saw this as a supporting that initiative uh, aligned to our social mobility pledge. Um, we, we, built it, we built a six-month structured program. Um, at the start of that program, we put in place a two-week pre-employability program because we wanted to welcome the candidates to the Compass Group family. Um, they work towards a employability sitting guilds um, qualification in that two weeks, which for some people who've you know, been at, at work for six months is a great um, welcome to Compass Group, but also a great achievement to start building their confidence and they start being a part of the family, meeting individuals and, and building that confidence and belief um, you know, that this is a programme for them. They then go on to their uh, uh, Kickstart opportunity placement. And we've built in in terms of um, a platform called Flow, where we use training modules that they work towards throughout that six months. So they've got that own ongoing training and development, as well as the mentoring and the skills development within the work experience placement. We've also built into wraparound support. We felt it really important to support our, our um, as we do any employee. Uh, so we do regular welfare calls um, to touch base with them as part of the apprenticeship team to ensure that they're okay from a health and wellbeing perspective, but also to see how they're progressing as well. And also we built in six progress reviews as part of that flow platform where we review their progress, et cetera. Currently got 31 uh, Kickstart uh, candidates on board and, and, um, and all 31 are still with us and they are four months into their journey of that six month window. Some of them have already been um, in terms of gone for um, job opportunities as we grow as a business and Great news that this week two of them have already been offered full-time employment and naturally for me the next step for that is to go on to the apprenticeship program um, as a large employer we're really proud of our apprenticeship program we kept that going during covid um, so that our apprentices could uh, progress and achieve aligned to the education skills funding um, compliance and funding guidelines and that's been really successful and we're proud of that and we very much see this as a future talent pipeline coming through being supported and moving on to the apprenticeship program as that first run onto the career ladder and their next uh, career progression with Compass Group. That's it's brilliant, um, Jonathan. So the kickstart sort of cohort, the first one, um, filtering into the apprenticeships sort of next phase. I, I know from, from other conversations, we've talked about how having a clear path so people can see from the very beginning, from getting their city and guilds off that two week sort of course, to set them on a pathway where they can see the milestones is, is hugely valuable. I mean, I mean, it's obviously a very structured and well thought through 
experience. It's not a kind of, here you go, 30 of you, good luck for six months and we'll see you at the end kind of thing. There's quite hard yards. I wonder, you, you're obviously good at this in Compass. You've got sort of systems and thoughts and experiences of looking after young people. If you were starting at the beginning with a kickstart cohort or even one person, what would be the sort of critical things that you would advise an employer to put in place to make sure it's a success for both parties? Absolutely. So I, I think the, the most critical thing to think of is one, why, why, we, why are you doing this, um, as Alicia has already highlighted, um, and then in terms of making sure um, we, we're proud of doing things small but doing them well, I think that's really important. This is a new initiative and we were really, you know, we wanted to ensure that we had a structured programme that those individuals knew exactly, one, what the Kickstart opportunity was in terms of when we completed the DWP job template that we submitted as, um, once we got our grants um, and that the um, DWP job coaches were being, being able to articulate that opportunity to those candidates when they went in and had their meeting with their job coach. Then the referral obviously comes through and I think it's really important then that an individual one knows what they're being referred for and why they're wanting that opportunity so that we pick up those conversations but also their structure from day one I think it's really important for anyone coming into an organization even as a new employee that we you know we want to make our people feel valued and feel important and looked after from the start and I think you know the structure we've put in place has absolutely done that and from the retention rate we've had with, with the first 31 that's still on program four months now I think that that speaks volumes and we also I think through listening to them in terms of getting their feedback because that's really important that we listen um, and gain the feedback and you know when you pick up the phone and you hear a kickstart um, candidate say that thank you so much for this opportunity I feel like I've got a purpose again I think that speaks well as well and, and, and that's for us in terms of the success of the program today. Yeah, massively um, satisfying, I'm sure, after all that effort. I'm going to come now, if I can, to Liz, the other Liz, Liz Bromley. Thank you so much for your patience, Liz, because um, the schemes are fantastic. And if you're running a department like Jonathan is, where you obviously have access to resources, you know what you're doing, you're fully committed to it. It all works brilliantly. It's a kind of tick, tick, tick. Now, you represent... Um, NCG and um, you come at it from the college perspective, sort of further education college. So it's a sort of matchmaking exercise somehow. It's not always obvious as an employer. If I if I know I want the person and I've got the scheme I'm going to use, how do I find the person? From your perspective, how has Kickstart been working from the sort of from the other side? Sure. Well, for, you know, first of all, let me say how absolutely fabulous it is to hear the kickstart scheme working in practice at compass and the things that jonathan has said about why are they doing it how are they giving the wraparound support for the student that is exactly the sort of approach that colleges you know die to hear for and uh, and fully fully endorse and of course the challenge is that when you have large organizations who are motivated by the development of their staff the development of young people and creating that talented pipeline for the benefit of their organization and the economy then you've got a real easy run at it but there are many businesses at this precise moment who are struggling to survive they're worrying about the bottom line they're worrying about their business coming back they're worrying about what the pandemic has, has done to them in the longer term and therefore it's difficult for them sometimes to keep their eye on that ball of positive engagement with their young people and developing that pipeline through talent nurturing <clears throat> so I suppose from the college perspective, and Curran said it right at the beginning, only 12,000 registrations so far. So it's been a bit of a slow start, which is a shame, but it's justifiable because we've been living through extraordinary times. I think it's much easier as a scheme for the larger employers to engage with because they're more likely to find 30 placements. And although the uh, entry requirements have been tailored over time, there is still that sort of initial barrier that might have put some of the smaller employers onto the back foot and has necessitated them thinking about, well, who can we go into partnership with? How can we fulfill the requirements? How can we get through the bureaucracy when actually we're trying to keep, keep going as a business? The other side that we've seen from the college perspective is that many of the uh, young people who ought to be beneficiaries of this great scheme are actually not deemed to be appropriate by the uh, job centre or they're not in receipt of universal credit. And that's two X's in the box because those are some parts of the requirements for students to get into the kickstart scheme. So, 
you know, it's a brilliant opportunity. It needs to be finessed to make sure that the right students are getting in with the right employers who are really giving them that kickstart to their professional life and to a really successful uh, future. Um, some colleges are working with local intermediaries to deliver training that is appropriate with employers. So there's all kinds of uh, back office stuff that needs to really be smoothed out. But for me, what does the college need to do to make it easy for the employers? We need to be really clear how you do it, how you access the students, how you meet the students, how you explain what the offer is from the employer to the potential student and the communications and indeed things like this through the CBI, the communications need to be really clear and reinforced over and over by the employer networks, uh, by the colleges and employers need to have the confidence to pick up the phone or even walk into colleges and say, this is what I want to do, put me in touch with the person who can really help me. <clears throat> and at MCG in Newcastle, we're uh, just opening um, a, an employer hub, which is going to be a very, very clearly visible front door for employers to come in and ask those really basic questions. How do I do it? How do I meet the students? What support are you going to give me? Who's going to do the training off the job? How am I going to make this scheme work for my business, for the young people I want to support? And how am I going to make them you know, really successful going into industry? And of course, the white paper, uh, Skills for Jobs, uh, gave us a really clear blueprint on the collaboration that this government expects between industry and employer networks and colleges, the further education delivery end of it. And, you know, for us, this is a marvellous opportunity to test out that collaboration and to make it work, because that's what we want to do. We want to be part of the economic recovery by working in partnership with those who are doing the work and the regions who want to see both employers and employees coming through their regions really successfully. Brilliant, Liz. Thanks so much. I'm just going to ask a really practical question to you, if I may, which is obviously, um, and Alyssa has, has outlined um, uh, this morning, that there are an element of time pressure in that the scheme at the moment is time box. We want for it to be extended. But if you're sitting there thinking, I would love to be part of this, and I, but I just don't know how to find my person. We mentioned before the webinar started, if we're thinking about recruiting young talent into Tortoise, for example, you'd think it'd be the easiest thing in the world. Surely the country is full of brilliantly talented young journalists, people who would love to have a crack at something like this. It's not always obvious how I go and find them. So if you've kind of laid out a sort of broad uh, picture of you need to engage with your local um, uh, further education college, you can pick up the phone, whether you're an SME or, or, or a large organisation. What is the sort of job title, if you like, of the person to call? Bearing maybe that my local um, further education college doesn't have yet a skills hub, let's say, or they're sort of on the journey to getting that in place. If I were to ring them up and say, if I wanted a kickstart placement, who do I talk to? Well, how do I literally do that? Well, you've absolutely put your finger on the real problem that we have because we're not at a point yet where the uh, college business centres have been established. Um, we've been closed down other than for teaching for nearly a year. So we're all getting back into business. Uh, if I was advising who to ring up, I would say speak to the apprenticeship manager because they are going to be most attuned not only to businesses that are engaging on apprenticeships, but also they will be uh, cognizant of the other schemes that are happening. But, you know, what the white paper has set out and what we in NCG and I know all of my college colleagues from other colleges are doing is looking at what college business centres will be because that will be the front door by which an employer can really clearly get into their local provider. They'll be able to get into the partnerships that will exist between further education and higher education. And we that, that will be the front door that will be, you know, that title that you want. I want to get the phone number for my local college business centre and I want to get in there and get my advice. But currently my, my brief answer would be ring your local college and ask to speak to the apprenticeship manager. Brilliant. Thanks ever so much, Liz. Jonathan, just going back to your, your original cohort of 31, where did you, how did you go about recruiting those people? What was your process so, to find them? So one of my advices to any employer thinking of doing Kickstart would be to build effective relationships with DWP. We've got a brilliant DWP contracts manager that works really closely with us. So from the start, I've been there in terms of the application stage in terms of when, and the implementation stage. We have a weekly call uh, with, that, with our DWP contracts manager, um, and then we talk through in terms of those opportunities. That, 
that person then goes and speaks to all the district managers in terms of based on postcode where those opportunities are and that builds that um, dialogue in terms of that opportunity and referrals coming through that way. We also work with um, external organisations uh, such as our preferred training providers, colleges, um, universities um, and obviously it can inform them in terms of the opportunities as well um, and obviously then signpost any individual that speaks to us about the opportunities through DWP because that's the process in terms of the referral route and that seems to be working really well. We've also been invited through the, uh, DWP to um, jobs fairs, so the district managers have regular jobs fairs where employers can go actually on to those live events and talk about their opportunities to those uh, job coaches within each DWP district area, again promoting that opportunity. Jonathan, that's really helpful. Um, I, th I think the more practical actions we can get on the call, the, the better. I think it's brilliant to know, well, what's my first step? Um, I wonder if you might also just to unpack a little bit, and I might come back to Liz in, in a second on this too. We've mentioned traineeships, we've mentioned apprenticeships, and obviously we've talked about Kickstart. How did you, and you sort of, um, you mentioned a little bit what you're using them for inside of Compass, the different sort of stages of people's careers and things. Are, are any one of those schemes or other ones that you might be aware of better suited to any other type of work we've talked about the sort of degree of experience of the person but can you deploy for example an apprentice or someone in a kickstart scheme in any part of your business yeah it obviously depends on the individual in terms of what their aspiration is in terms of their career journey most importantly and in terms of talking and identifying the right opportunity for that um, candidate um, i think it's I think what the experience we've had is that the calibre of people coming through Kickstart it, it, it is varied and I, and I think that's great, I think, I think that's really important. I think, you know, for people that are just from a confidence perspective that a front of house opportunity is right for them in the hospitality industry, that they can be coached, mentored, trained in those skills, fantastic. But we've also had people that through Covid have lost their job, they left the university, got a job in the city in terms of from an IT perspective. Um, and then saw an opportunity within our IT um, department and, and they just saw that as a great opportunity to get in to a great company like Compass Group and, and develop their skills again uh, and, and they are absolutely sailing so it's, it's varied is what I would say but it's about making sure that we match those individuals to their aspirations um, and that it's right for them in terms of that skills development and their longer term career progression as well. We really want these people to stay with us uh, great talent coming through and as I say onto the apprenticeship program. Understood that's great um, Liz I might bring you back in because before we started you had your brilliant long list of all manner of a veritable smorgasbord of different types of schemes that people can engage with and um, to piece it all together it's quite a complex thing you know there's lots to choose from again how could an employer best go about understanding the complete range of things that they might want to sort of work towards depending on what kind of company you are? Absolutely. And um, and first of all, I would like to really build on the point that Jonathan has just made again. Um, DWP have now launched the Youth Hub scheme and colleges are now creating virtual youth hubs, working in partnership with DWP and local authorities, a uh, range of other local agencies, but colleges are pivotal to this. And um, so far we've been working with virtual hubs, you know, as we as we've all been working yeah. in conference virtually but very soon there'll be real face-to-face -face, uh, points of guidance and engagement and those youth hubs are going to be great places to identify the appropriate schemes for young people and indeed for employers so NCG has got youth hubs in Carlisle College and in our London colleges uh, that I think is going to be another really really good uh, front door scheme but you're absolutely right you know the apprenticeship is the tried and trusted route for um for training and employment and engagement between education and real real life work and i think you know again coming out of the white paper if we can look through local skills improvement plans at the opportunities for large companies uh, like compass to be engaging in national apprenticeship schemes that have got step on step off points so that they can really engage with ambitious workforce development working hand in hand with local colleges and most importantly with students who've got varying levels of talent and ambition then we could be looking at a completely different skills landscape uh, but until we get to that point uh, we've got kickstart start we've got the trainee um uh, traineeship apprenticeship uh, sorry the traineeship incentive scheme the apprenticeship incentive scheme 
We've got sector-based work academy programs, also administered by Job Centre Plus. We've got the digital and technical skills boot camps. And let's be really clear, digital, te technological, technical skills are going to be the absolute mainstay of the workforce in the future. We've got the restart, restart scheme for people who are on universal credit, who've been out to work for between 12 and 18 months. We've got the job entry targeted support scheme, and then we've got the youth hubs, which I've just mentioned. So there's lots out there, which of course is terrific on one hand and complicated on the other. So use DWP, use the youth hubs, use the colleges as points of uh, contact, commu communication and advice. But if I could just sort of close this off with a thing about language, we are all worrying about the lost generation and you know the, the lost opportunities, the disadvantage that's been out there. If we reframe that and say, we've never in our history lived through a world like, like this last year, right across the world, our young people, who yes, may be facing unemployment, are also the generation of resilience. They're the ones who've lived through this cataclysmic time and are coming out the other side with an understanding of what remote learning, remote study is like. They are getting the basic training for what the world of work is probably going to look like in the future. And if we build them up with these terrific schemes that are being supported by the government, by colleges, by employers, into our young people not being the lost generation and the unemployed, but the first generation of doing things differently, the first generation of collaboration between industry and education, and the first generation to show us what a new world is going to look like, then it puts them into a different mindset. It puts employers onto the front foot, not the back foot. And it really means that we can start to shape a future under our control with a great deal of opportunities for our young people and indeed people who are coming out of one workforce and going into a new space. Brilliant call to arms, Liz. I, I love that. So a, a great sort of change of gear um, uh, to end on. I'm going to just before I come to back to Lord Billamore for some closing comments, I do really want to flag what Alice has just posted in the chat, the link to the CBI Education and Skills Survey, which is still open but closes on Friday. So this is a really big opportunity for you to sort of plug in what you think you need, what's working, what isn't, and just to sort of have your say to inform um, the, the future sort of education and skills policies that come out of the, the CBI and as, and as Lord Blimore said at the beginning, the government do listen. So make sure you tell the truth and get to do a good job of the content of the survey. Um, so, um, Karen, we've heard a, a huge amount of really practical and thought provoking and interesting experiences this morning. Um, do you want to just close us out with, with, with a sort of a, a, a few remarks? Thank you so much, Liz. This is what the CBI is all about. What a fantastic session, real value, practical advice and insight. So, Alyssa, thanks so much for setting out uh, all the options and, you know, extending the Kickstarter scheme is so important. I mean, it's like the VAT reduction from 20% to 5% for hospitality. Well, what use is that if your outlet is closed? You need to have it open to benefit from it. So that's why we asked for an extension for that and the government listens. So similarly over here, you've got a great scheme, will allow us and businesses to actually avail of it. Uh, Jonathan, thank you so much for all the fantastic um, examples from Compass. I mean, a, a company we all admire and, and the pipeline, the building confidence, I thought that was so important when you mentioned that. Um, apprenticeships, traineeships, kickstart, matching uh, individuals to their aspirations, uh, people feeling valued uh, and looked after, and, and you know how employees are treated. I think this, uh, going to what Liz Bromley said at the end, people are going to remember after this crisis, how were they treated, how did companies treat their employees? Uh, I feel like I have my purpose again. And the really important point you made about collaboration between the DWP, working closely, government and business collaborating. And Liz, that came right through your, what you said. I was Chancellor of Thames Valley University, University of West London, so very aware of further education, higher education, the link between further and higher, communication being so important. Again, collaboration between government, colleges, employers, further education, higher education, the youth hub scheme, importance of digital. Uh, and then this really important point that you made right at the end, that the lessons learned in the youth in particular, resilience, adaptation, collaboration. Wow, really powerful. Thank you so much to all of you. It's been a privilege to participate in this and thank you Liz for sharing it so brilliantly. 
Well, it's my absolute pleasure. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you so much um, to Alyssa, to Jonathan, to the other Liz, and, and of course, to Lord Billamoria, as always. And um, there's no CBI webinar on Monday because it's bank holiday, but we will be back on Wednesday, so a week today, with everybody's favourite topic of Brexit and customs, because it seems like that hasn't gone away yet. Um, have a great weekend, everybody, and um, I'll see you next week. Take care. Bye.